just trying to find today I'm just trying to find a good spot so that people can see me oh with my camera and all oh so people are logging on good evening that's wonderful tonight we're going to look at the ever so much enjoyable topic of divine violence I uh, hope you got the notes. I posted them on Facebook uh, a little while ago. And um, as always, they will also be on the website uh, under sermons and series. And I'm also collating these videos on YouTube and a link and they're there as well. So there we go. And something just pinged at me. Okay, I'll go and look at that in a second or two. We're about scheduled to start in, in a moment. So, uh, wait for my computer to say seven, and then we'll get started. Uh, hadn't expected this to take quite so long. Ah, look, let's start. Let's start. We'll pray. Loving God, we ask that you'd be with us, that you open our minds and our hearts, that we might learn and explore, that we might more faithfully reflect you in the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So, as I said um, previously, I wanted to look back at uh, a rectory study we did a little while ago uh, where we were looking at the topic of divine violence uh, and uh, it's look it's an important topic it's an important topic that needs to be addressed and um, the first place I came across it as a as a as an important topic uh, is was in a book by Phyllis Tribble uh, I think it was called, oh, uh, Texts of, Texts of Terror is what it was called. And um, she looked at the story from Judges chapter 11, 30 to 40. And I'm going to read it. And then I'm going to just kind of unpack some of the places where we get violence. Uh, and Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return and triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated twenty towns from Aro to the vicinity of Minith, as far as Abel Karamin. Thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child. Except for her, he had neither son nor daughter. When he, when he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you promised, now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites. But grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends, because I will never marry. You may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed, and she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite tradition that each year the young women of Israel go out for four days to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite. So um, there's a lot of there's a lot of violence in that text, um, and it's not it's not the violence like we sometimes get in the movies that's quite graphic, uh, but it's it's all through it. So it starts with this. Uh, battle between Jephthah and the Ammonites 
And he makes this deal with God that says, God, I will give you as a burnt offering whatever comes out of my door first, if you will just give me victory in battle. And so the 20 towns get sacked. I think it says 20. Um, and this is a sign that, at least uh, as far as um, Jephthah understands it, that God has accepted the bargain. God has accepted the deal that Jephthah entered into. Uh, and so we, we see the violence in the towns being, at least in the text, condoned by God. Uh, and in fact, in a sense, blessed by God because it becomes uh, successful. Jephthah returns home uh, and his daughter comes out of the house first. Now, some people are really go, oh, maybe he was expecting a dog to come out and greet him or, or a servant or, or something like that. I don't know. But you have to think that, you know, some he was expecting someone to come out of the door first or, or, or possibly, as I say, something. But even if it was a servant, what if it was his wife? Or it, it's still Jephthah has offered a person as as sacrifice to God. Um, and that's that should be deeply problematic, especially as it seems as if in this passage, God endorsed the offer, endorsed, you know, he may not have started the bargain, but he signed the contract. Uh, and so the story continues. We get Jephthah's daughter. She says, basically, you know, he says, oh, I'm devastated. And she shows faith by saying, well, you made this promise. You've got to live into it. Give me two months to go and, I don't know, weep in the hill country um, because I will never marry. In, in this day and age, even that's a, a piece of perhaps social violence where the only value a woman has is as, um, is as a wife and mother. We'll get to that later. Uh, you may go, he said, and he let her go for two months, comes back, uh, and she's sacrificed. Um, and, and Phyllis Tribble, who, as I said earlier, was the first person to kind of put me onto this particular text, points out that in the text, we have God at least endorsing violence. We have a, a culture that accepts this violence. 20 towns are sacked. It's appropriate to offer human sacrifices. Um, and this text doesn't remember her name. She's not named. Uh, and so we get all these places of really conflicting violence. Now, it's not the worst in the Bible. It's not. Um, you know, there are places where, where God instructs in extreme violence and then gets angry when people aren't violent enough. Uh, you know, the, it, there's some confronting stuff in there. And given that, given that there's this uh, um, uh, uh, extreme violence, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, and there's a couple of options. There's a couple of options. Uh, the first one, and I actually, look, I, I, I'm kind of, it's quite a common option. But uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm deliberately putting it in the words of Marcion. So one of the things we can do is we can uh, ignore it. You know, we can go, oh, that's the God of the Old Testament, or the Old Testament's full of violence, all the rest of it. Um, and, and the person that I kind of wanted to highlight, who's, who in a sense is the one who starts that tradition, is, is a person called Marcion. Now, Marcion uh, um, is one of the first people to experiment with a Christian canon. Uh, so we're talking a long time ago, you know. Um, anyway, so his study of the Hebrew Scriptures, what we would call the Old Testament, uh, and along with the writings that were circulating in the early Christian church, so this is before we had the New Testament, obviously. Um, but, you know, Paul's letters, uh, by this stage, perhaps some of the Gospels, certainly the Gospel of 
uh, Luke, uh, what he was familiar with. Uh, he's, he suggests that they're totally incompatible. And so what Marcion does is he actually comes up with this uh, structure that says there are two gods. There's the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, um, and there's the God of Jesus. And, and the God of Jesus is the higher, transcendent, better God. So the God of the Old Testament is, is kind of this angry, but also earthy kind of thing. And so if you know some of the stuff around Gnosticism, you'll see that Marcion's answer to violence, at least in the Old Testament, uh, is to go to Gnosticism. This idea that there is a, there is a higher God and then a lower God, and it's the lower God that's kind of the God of the Old Testament, and the higher God, that's the God of the New Testament. One of the reasons I picked Marcion is because, well, he, he was declared a heretic, because, partially because he rejected uh, the Old Testament, and parts of the New Testament as well, because he said they were too influenced by the God of the Old Testament. Um, and, and in a sense, when, when people do this now, we're, we're, we're feeding into the same idea. So it's an option. And, and you know, there are ways we, 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 we kind of do that, aren't there? Um, I know as a, as a person who gets up and preaches, most of the time I'm preaching on the New Testament. I'm preaching on the Gospels. I, I'm, I'm not, not reading from the Old Testament in church or anything like that. But I'm focusing, and if you focus in one place, you automatically kind of aren't focusing somewhere else. Yeah, that's just how it works. So we kind of we kind of actually do this, but we certainly should be wary of having it as a uh, let's say a formal approach to things where we separate out the God, the violent God, and the God that we currently like. Um, yeah, so, so that's one option. The next option, um, if, you've got the, if you've got the notes that I linked to, uh, this is the option that has the cute little picture of the alien. Uh, and I like it because he says, why are you calling, who are you calling an alien? You're the one from a faraway planet of Earth in the mysterious Milky Way galaxy buster. It, it, it just turns it around a little bit. Uh, it makes us the alien for a moment. Um, and one of the ways that people often approach the question of violence in the Bible, particularly violence it seems to be endorsed by God, is to say that that was just their culture of the time. So that's a cultural reflection that we're getting in, in, in Scripture. And it was to say that uh, all significant events found their origin in God. So if there was a volcano, which is a pretty significant event, God. If there was a battle and one side won, God. Uh, and so all, all significant events, you know, events that involved kings and emperors and, and, and cities and towns, all kind of had as a, as a significant major component, God. And so violence was often seen as perhaps punishment from God. Uh, so if, you know, in, in the example of, of Jephthah's daughter, um, it's seen as an acceptable payment to God. In John's Gospel, in the New Testament, uh, we get Jesus' disciples in John 9, chapter 2. Uh, that's the story of the man born blind. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? You see, Jesus' disciples operate in a sense that of saying, or of accepting that being born blind, not quite the same as being sacrificed, but that experience of violence is a punishment for sin. Uh, and that's one way of looking at it. In the New Testament, Jesus actually speaks against that. 
uh, for me, historically, that was probably my go-to option, actually, is I would kind of minimize the violence by suggesting that it was primarily a cultural experience or a reflection of a particular culture. I would, um, you know, I would say things like what happened to Jephthah's daughter is a tragedy. Uh, it certainly wasn't endorsed by God. But the people in that time understood that uh, if you entered into a contract like that, um, you had to maintain your end of the contract. So, uh, or once again, using, say, for example, a plague or, or something like that, I would, I would suggest that all of those were, um, they weren't actually God endorsing the violence, but rather there was just kind of a cultural reflection on these tragedies that happened. I'm starting to become less fond of that, um, partially because connected to the idea of tolerance. Um, and, and I'll start with intolerance. So if you think of, of, say, people who might have a gluten intolerance or a dairy intolerance or one of those sorts of things, their body doesn't react well to those things. But if you're tolerant, your body doesn't... Uh, react against it but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good it just means that you don't have the push back and a cultural tolerance might be things like oh well that's just their culture um, and you know we would never do that but what you get is you get kind of a, a cultural superiority where hey our culture is much better than their culture um, but if you look at the world it's not, you know, in some ways, sure, you know, we, we have better literacy, we live longer, all those sorts of things. Um, but we also have economic structures where, um, you know, Jeff Bezos is about to become a trillionaire, a trillionaire, that's a bonkers amount of money. Um, but he does that by having staff that are almost worked to death for below minimum wage. Uh, we have, um, you know, uh, clothing brands that use basically slave labor. We, it's a sad state of affairs, isn't it? Where you have to buy, um, uh, fair trade coffee. Uh, not that I have a problem with fair trade coffee, but that's the only way to get ethical stuff. Is it, it, it that it actually is the, the stuff that's marketed? Um, and, and so our culture is certainly not a culture that doesn't have violence in it. And if we say it was just their culture, one, we're claiming a sense of superiority, which I don't think we can. And two, all we're doing is we are kind of quarantining the violence uh, as somebody else's problem. But these are our sacred scriptures. Now, nobody's reading this and struggling with the problem of divine violence. If, they're, if they don't at least take it seriously to some extent. So, so I, I'm starting to become less a fan of option two. You know, sure, it can be a bit of a filter, but less a fan. Um, so I'm going to move on to option three. Option three. Uh, and the idea here is that we seek a trajectory. Uh, so, so what we do is we, we kind of look at this story that has the violence or perhaps the divine God's endorsing of violence uh, and we we look at how at what that might have to say and what what's the trajectory that starts so that's not the end point but that's the starting point uh, and, and and that gives us a trajectory to follow look and I think I think that has some merit to it in fact um, and, you know, there, there are times when, when that can seriously be a, a useful way to understand things, um, is to look at the trajectory and how God's trajectory perhaps differs from the cultural trajectory and ask, you know, which one do we want to follow? You know, um, uh, you know Jesus cared for the poor, the widow, the orphan, uh, 
um, the, the prophets cared for the, for, for the widow and the alien in the land. And so it, there, there's something to be said quite strongly for, for, for looking at the trajectory that it was taking and to say that we should be following that trajectory. One example that I came across, um, just so you know, this is where I've got the picture of Mario looking at, um, I like the pixelated Mario, because you get like the trajectory of, uh, you know, from pixelated games up to the far better rendering of games now. That's, I like that image. So uh, one of the rabbis, Rabbi, Rabbi Ari Khan, uh, he sort of has a presentation in this view when it comes to the binding of Isaac. So you remember the story, um, uh, Abram and Isaac, they, they, they go to the mountain so that um, Isaac can be sacrificed. And what he suggests is that Isaac's death was never really a possibility. And not as far as Abraham was concerned. He certainly acts like it's a possibility, but anyway. And not as far as God was concerned. God's command to Abraham was very specific. Abraham understood it very precisely. Isaac was to be raised up as an offering. And God would use the opportunity to teach humankind once and for all that human sacrifice, child sacrifice, is not acceptable. Now I'm happy with the outcome of child sacrifice is not acceptable. Uh, and, I, and I like that as a kind of a trajectory. I think to suggest that Abraham understood that that was the, the, the object lesson here. Um, I Look, I don't... You can make the argument. Ra, uh, Rabbi Ari Khan certainly does. Um, but the structure of the narrative certainly doesn't indicate that he was uh, aware of that. So, so we one option is to is to seek a trajectory to just say, look, this is where it's going, and it's our responsibility to continue down that path. Uh, option number four. Option number four. And I only came up with four options for 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 this. So you know, we're pretty close to the end. Um, that's where I've got the image there of Greta Thunberg, um, who's something of a of a cultural moment, isn't she? Um, so. I've got a bit of an article here where uh, Greta is involved in a um, uh, an, an argument. Uh, so she dismissed the usual admonitions that climate is complex, um, and I'm sure she didn't actually admit dismiss that because she would be aware that the climate is very complex. Um, but she's grown impatient when grown-ups explain to her that structural reform is hard, sensitive, intricate, takes time. And that nothing in life is black and white. Uh, that's a lie, she says. Either we prevent temperatures from rising above 1.5 degrees Celsius, or we don't. Either we avoid chain reactions of an unraveling ecosystem, or we don't. That's as black and white as it gets. I often hear adults say we need to give the next generation hope, she concluded. I don't want your hope. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I do every day, and I want you to act. I want you to behave like your house is on fire. Because it is. You see, what Greta does is she looks at the, at the situation and she's reacting against the, the environment. She's disturbed by the information she has. And so she's galvanized to action. Um, and, and it's that action that has catapulted her into a place of significance in the world. Um, and there's a part of me that suggests that that is in fact the appropriate response to, from us, reading some of these uh, passages which have violence endorsed in them. So actually say, no, that's the mirror that we want to reject. That's the, the face of violence that I want to reject. And so it's important that the violence be in scripture so that it can be preserved so that every generation sees it and is confronted by it so rather than trying to uh, carefully carve it out of scripture leave it there as a uh, as a stain that we are forced to confront when we when we're engaged in it and so that way we make in every generation, every 
community that comes to this text says, no, that's wrong. And, and we're going to live in a different way. Uh, I don't know if you can tell. I don't know if you can tell. I've kind of, at the moment at least, at the moment at least, I like that option. I like the idea that one of the functions of the violence in Scripture is for us to see it and go, no. It worries me that too many people, because it's in the Bible, uh, think it's endorsed. Um, and, and endorsed by God. And that's, that's a problem with how we read the Bible and how we understand the Bible. Um, but for me, that's the place where I'm coming to at the moment on divine violence. Happy to seek a, seek a trajectory, um, but right now, to push back against it, I think. And to push back against violence. Uh, and to use other parts of Scripture, in fact, to, to do that. So, um, you know, uh, when we think about uh, the disciples who asked Jesus, why was this man born blind? And Jesus says, look, you've misunderstood it. To then have, if, some, if we see places where God in Judges seems to be endorsing the violence to actually say, mm, Jesus actually points to a different picture. And so create a dynamic within Scripture that allows the other voices to be stronger. Okay, um, that's it from me for now. Now I see uh, Paul or Alex, I'm not sure which, uh, put up Ada as a question mark when we're talking about Jephthah's daughter. Um, and I'm not quite sure of the, the reference. Um, so I do know that in some of the uh, non-scriptural texts, Jephthah's daughter has, is given a name. And uh, I used to know it. I did look it up. But uh, I didn't get, I, I don't recall it. I, I looked it up many years ago when I was doing it for an assignment and I came across it and I was, yeah, uh, quite happy with that. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if you're suggesting that Ada is Jephthah's daughter's name. Uh, could have been, could have been. Uh, David, you're saying 20 towns um, in 2020. Uh, I'm not sure if you're suggesting that 2020 is is um, divine punishment for the 20 towns that Jephthah destroyed. Um, uh, we'll have to have a conversation about that some other time. Anyway... Um, I'm going to say thank you very much. If you've got any other questions, send me a message, put them up, and I can maybe come back to them later. The other thing is, I'm starting to run out of uh, uh, 20 towns uh, of 20 people. Um, possibly. Uh, Beth, uh, Bethlehem, where, where Jesus was born. Oh, so the unnamed sacrifice is almost another layer of insult to an already horrible story. Yes, the fact that um, Jephthah's daughter isn't named is a textual uh, violence uh, against Jephthah's daughter. Uh, David, oh, you're asking were the people in the, in the towns uh, actually dead? Um, I don't know. All we have is the text that says he devastated 20 towns. Um, so, you know, uh, whether, whether he killed everyone in the town or not, there's still uh, quite a significant amount of violence going on there. Um, so, yeah. Um, but yes, Paul uh, or Alex, um, that, that is part of what uh, Phyllis Tribble highlighted for me, was that, um, the, that she's unnamed is a structural violence against this young woman who is sacrificed uh, because her dad made a foolish promise to God. Um, which, yeah, I mean, we, we so often don't get names in, in Scripture, we sometimes miss the, what that means.
Um, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, like I said, I'm going to be storing these on you. These will be on Facebook. We can catch up on them later. I will be storing them on YouTube as well. And uh, yeah, if you have any other topics for a discussion, please shoot me a message. Good night. Thank you. Go in peace.